Today we have uh, breaking news. Um, the newspaper in Kyoto, um, actually I think that is the name of the newspaper, it, um, it reports alarm sounded at Fukushima plant uniform cooling system stopped on February 24th. Um, reactor number four pools cooling fans hauled it and the operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant say uh, a cooling fan for the spent fuel pool at number four reactor stopped working and TEPCO announced on Tuesday that a warning alarm for electrical problem went off. They will switch to the second one and the cooling uh, should resume around 1 p.m. Um, that was uh, the 24th, today's the 27th. Apparently they had workers there and I do have a pod I wanted to play, so I guess we'll start with that. Um, here we go. At the Fukushima Daiichi power plant have reported a new problem. They say a cooling system for a pool of spent nuclear fuel temporarily stopped working. An alarm indicating an electrical problem went off on Tuesday morning. The cooling system at the number four reactor building stopped because of a partial power failure. Managers say workers digging on a nearby road may have damaged an electrical cable. They switched to an alternative power supply and resumed cooling in the afternoon. Officials at the plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, say temperatures in the pool didn't rise significantly. A hydrogen explosion damaged the reactor building in the wake of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Workers have been removing spent fuel rods from the pool and transferring them to a storage facility. The power failure forced them to suspend operations, but they were able to resume work in the afternoon. It is February 25th, 2014 on Tuesday. It's 3.55 p.m. Pacific time. And up next, this is your Fukushima radiation update from e, &E News. Kyoto. Alarm sounds at Fukushima plant. Unit 4 cooling system stops. This is a video published February 24th, 2014 at 11.12 p.m. Eastern Time by e, e News. NHK February 24th, 2014 at 9.39 p.m. Eastern Time. Fukushima number 4 reactor pools cooling fan halts. The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant says a cooling fan for the spent fuel pool at the number 4 reactor has stopped working. TEPCO announced on Tuesday that a warning alarm for an electrical problem went off. It will switch to the second one and cooling should resume by around 1 p.m. A nearby electrical cable may have been damaged in excav excavation work. Kyoto News, February 25, 2014. Translation. Spent fuel cooling system stops at Fukushima No. 4 reactor. Fukushima 4 reactor spent fuel pool cooling stops. The leakage warning sounded in the nuclear power facility. TEPCO, February 25, 2014. Translation. Cooling systems at Fukushima Unit 4 spent fuel pool now offline. Around 9 a.m. in road excavation between the process main building and incineration building. Hurt the cable. No abnormality in the voltage value of the power plant and has continued the supply of power. Watch the NHK broadcast right here and it's in Japanese only. All right. That's going to do it for your Fukushima radiation update. Please take care and be safe. Pinko. And so back to our um, my part. Um, we just listened to two uh, audio pods. One was uh, a an audio Fukushima Unifor, another human error by Mama Naak on YouTube. And the second one was uh, another YouTube provided by Pink Sapphire T2. Uh, it was called Fukushima Radiation 2-2514 Uniform Cooling System Stops. And uh, there's also alternative information uh, available there. Uh, uh, that's the, the uh, Pink Sapphire Alternative Information is uh, another website that they 
provide information on globalist Illuminati, government corruption, military war politics, constitution, freedom, and much more. Sounds like Awake Radio. Uh, but before we get to the Fukushima Week in Review, last Thursday, February 20th, 2014, on our chemical connections, Fukushima Weekly update, we reported on the nuclear leak at the waste isolation pilot plant, New Mexico, the location of the world's third deep geological repository for radioactive waste. And this week, on the lamestream media, reports that WIP, Radiation leak is equivalent to, you guessed it, bananas. So uh, the leak was reported after a fire broke out on a slant truck in the deep underground caverns. So we have another audio ready set up. And this, this audio is uh, nuclear watch emergency plan at WIP saw truck catches fire. So this is actually how this emergency all came about. So here we go to the audio call. An imminent situation going on right now in southern New Mexico at Carlsbad. Emergency response crews have activated an emergency plan at WIP. Here's what we know right now. Shortly after 11 a.m., WIP's emergency operations center was evacuated. They tell us an underground vehicle used to transport salt was on fire in the underground. So far, we know that all personnel are accounted for and have been safely evacuated to the surface. KOAT Action 7 News is working on getting every detail on the scary situation from southern New Mexico. We'll see you tonight. Okay, and we continue with this breaking news with a report from ENE News. Um, and we have another audio. It is WIP fire out. Officials say workers treated for smoke inhalation released from hospital. And that was reported by Mike Springer, uploaded by the YouTube KOAT.com. And the last pod, um, I don't know that I announced who the YouTuber was, uh, Dave H-A-R-M-E-S-S-O-N, for that last pod. So here's the next pod. The fire's out. Is the nation's first repository for radioactive waste left behind from research and production of nuclear weapons. Officials at the plant say the fire was contained and none of the radioactive waste was affected because it's in a different mine from where the truck caught fire. Officials say readings in the mine indicate the fire is out, but they can't confirm that until crews are able to go back inside. Now crews are working on a plan to do just that, but it has to be approved first by the U.S. Mine Safety and Health Administration. In the meantime, waste handling operations near the mine have been suspended and access to the site is being restricted. And the cause of that fire remains under investigation. Reporting in Loving, New Mexico, Mike Springer, KOAT Action 7 News. WIP receives about 20 shipments of waste a week from all over the country, including Los Alamos National Lab. And uh, back to me. Uh, the U.S. officials state large amounts of radioactive particles were released during initial puff event at the leaking nuclear site. Experts state plutonium can travel a long way in the wind. Um, they're saying that we shouldn't worry yet. <laughs> yet is the key word. And uh, there was videos published. Uh, this was reported by ENE News on February 25th. Carlsbad residents uh, meeting on waste isolation pilot plant, um, that's the WIP, is the world's third deep geological repository for radioactive waste and the radiation released um, pr prompted a question. Whenever Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring Research Center, or CEMRC, Director Russell Hardy was standing at the WIP site, pulling the filter, how many millirems was he exposed to? Rough Oklahoma City, earlier this month, the Department of Energy confirmed a radiation leak was detected at the nuclear waste site in New Mexico. Now, the information has Oklahomans concerned about the ramifications in the Sooner State. Uh, on February 14th, the Department of Energy confirmed a radiation leak was found at the radiation isolation power plant near Car Carlsbad, New Mexico. The, the plant is used to store waste from the production of nuclear bombs. Right now, officials don't know why it happened, how much radiation has leaked, and exactly where it went. That leads many people wondering if the radiation from New Mexico could reach the Sooner State. One expert 
and Albuquerque tells Channel 4 News that Oklahomans shouldn't panic yet. He says there is already more radiation found around the world from decades-old nuclear testing than this leak could produce. Don Hancock, director of the Nuclear Waste Safety Program at Southwest Research and Information Center said, my view is people don't need to be immediately concerned that you're getting a lot of plutonium and americium in your soil or, or in your air in Oklahoma City. Now that's what you would normally have. Dale Janway, the mayor of Carlsbad, New Mexico, said the radiation levels detected are far below EPA danger levels. Hancock says the Department of Energy, which did not return our calls, will have to wait two or three weeks before anyone can safely go underground to assess the situation. And uh, last night, uh, while I was listening to another report on the internet, I heard that they are actually uh, sending some people from the EPA, they're professionals, so they say, and it, they had a concern that they were sending the EPA and not the Department of Energy. So uh, there's a lot of things going on right now. Uh, Roger Nelson, the U.S. Department of Energy, when he was there, uh, the large amounts of particulate that were in the puffs as it went by were gone. According to KFOR Channel 4 News, reported on February 24, 2014, Kevin Ogle for KFOR Anchor said WIP leak is being called a radiation event and you know what? It could be making its way here to Oklahoma. Officials say a radiation leak happened sometime between February 11th and February 16th at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant. What they're saying, not totally reassuring. They're saying we shouldn't worry yet. Uh, Ed Donnie KFOR reporter says, yet is the key word. Kevin says experts are hesitant to push the panic button right now. Could a radiation leak at an underground nuclear waste site in southeast New Mexico reach Oklahoma? Don Hancock, nuclear waste expert, says it very much depends on the winds because plutonium and americium can travel a long way. Dr. John Nail, Oklahoma City University chemistry professor, says most people will get more radiation exposure from eating bananas than they ever will from this New Mexico repository site. Um, I, have a, I have an audio for that, but I'm going to save it for later. Right now we're going to go to <laughs> the WIPP radiation level slightly elevated, and that was posted by YouTuber WK. RQE. Dental radiation release at the WIP site near Carlsbad last week. New test results today show slightly elevated levels of airborne radiation. The DOE says that data shows a potential dose of 1.3 to 4.4 millirems. To give you an idea of what that means, a single chest x ray will expose a person to 10 millirems. The DOE says the average, person in the average person in the U.S. gets exposed to more than 600 millirems every year from naturally occurring radiation. They consider this radiation release not at all. A yeah, like they said, um, it's equivalent to eating bananas or some crap. I don't know. but um, uh, We also have Waste Isolation Power Plant New Mexico Radiation Leak Update. Um, Port block time zero plutonium cloud was 330 million becquerels in size. Um, that's pretty uh, pretty large when you consider. I think it's like one or two becquerels is is the limit. <laughs> so uh, anyway, DOE claims current release safe, but uh, they're claiming it's safe because it's being dispersed in the air and you won't be standing in the burst so you don't get the full effect of it. So as it permeates across the nation and across the world, but we'll just continue. Based on new information obtained during, during a Carlsbad, New Mexico town hall meeting, the plutonium cloud size at time zero, ground zero, can be estimated at three 
130 million becquerels contained in approximately 10,000 cubic meters of contaminated air released over a 30 second time frame. The earliest measurements were based on information obtained at a site approximately one half a mile northwest of the WIP facility in New Mexico. The plutonium cloud at that site measured approximately 110 million becquerels. The new on-site information is from the detector located near the ventilation exhaust shaft where the normalized reading came out to be approximately three times higher. Information currents as of Saturday 2 22.14 indicated that the site is still emitting approximately 6,667 becquerels every minute. What an interesting number. Assuming that the WIP site is using their maximum ventilation rate of 20,000 cubic meters of mine exhaust air per, per minute. So while the on-air minute by minute release are still quite large at 6,666 becquerels. They're dispersed in 20,000 cubic meters of air each minute. The average person inhales 0 0.05 cubic meters of air per minute. So I guess that means it's safe. Um, I don't know, it doesn't sound safe to me. And that was reported by BeforeIt'sNews.com, Opinion Conservative. Waste Isolation Pilot Plant WIP New Mexico Radiation Leak Update 22514. Um, uh, that was a, a website. According to uh, Wikipedia, on 22514, americium was first produced in 1944 by a group of Glenn T. Seaborg at the University of California, Berkeley. Although it, it is the third element in the transuranic series. And transuranic means any atomic uh, weight over 92. It was discovered fourth after the heavier curium. The discovery was kept secret and only released on the public in November 2000, um, 1945. Most um, Amherst americium is produced by bombarding uranium or plutonium with neutrons in nuclear reactors. One ton of spent nuclear fuel contains about 100 grams of americium. It is widely used in commercial ionization chamber smoke detectors as well as in neutron sources and industrial gauges. And last week um, I reported on uh, the uh, radon that they they reported a lot in the late 80s and early 90s that people had to be concerned about is actually uh, located in the bricks that they used to build houses or or I don't know if it's it's part of the the natural currents in the bricks or was a result of uh, some of the uh, activity by the DOD <laughs> Uh, that happened to get into the material that made the bricks, but that's for another show. Several unusual applications such as a nuclear battery or fuel for spaceships with nuclear propulsion have been proposed for the isotope americium M242, and I really couldn't get a clarification on that. Uh, so we'll just continue, but they are as yet hindered by the scarcity and high price of this nuclear isomer. Now, an isomer is different from an isotope, and we will uh, talk about that a little bit later. Americium is a relatively soft radioactive metal with a silver, silvery appearance. Its most common isotopes are americium-241 and americium-243. In chemical compounds, they usually assume the oxidation state plus 3, especially in solutions. Several other oxidation states are known, which range from plus 2 and plus 7, and can be identified by the characteristic optical absorption spectra. The crystal lattice of solid americium and its compounds contain intrinsic defects, which are induced by self-irradiation with alpha particles, 
and accumulated with time, this results in a drift of some material properties. Initial experiments yielded four americium isotopes, americium-241, 242, 239, and 238. Americium-241 was directly obtained from plutonium upon absorption of one neutron. It decays by a emission of a particle to 237, uh, I think that's new, new uh, I, I, uh, I'm not sure, NP, I thought I knew what it was yesterday and I didn't write it down, my mistake, um, it would be some kind of oh, nuclear plutonium, I'm not sure what the N stands for, but I'm pretty sure the P is plutonium 237, the half-life of this decay was first determined as uh, 510 plus or minus 20 years. Okay, so it was 510 plus or minus 20 years, but then corrected at 432.2 years. Uh, the second isotope, <coughs> excuse me, of americium-242 was produced upon neutron bombardment of the already created 241. Upon rapid beta decay, americium-242 converts to the isotope of curium-242, which had been discovered previously. The half-life of this decay was initially determined at 17 hours, which was closely to the presently accepted value of 16.02 hours. So here we have a bunch of numbers. Uh, it could be 17 hours exposure time to 432.2 years. <laughs> so it's a pretty wide margin. And continuing, the discovery of americium and curium in 1944 was closely related to the Manhattan Project. Hmm. The results were confidential and declassified only in 1945. Seaborg leaked the synthesis of the elements 95 and 96 on the U.S. radio show for children, the Quiz Kids, five days before the official presentation at the American Chemical Society meeting on the 11th of November 1945, when one of the listeners asked whether any new transuranium elements besides plutonium and neptunium had been discovered during the war. After the discovery of americium isotopes 241 and 242, their production and compounds were patented, listing only Seaborg as the inventor. The initial americium samples weighed a few micrograms. They were barely visible and were identified by the radioactivity. The first substantial amounts of metallic americium weighing 40 to 200 micrograms were not prepared until 1951 by reduction of americium fluoride with barium metals in high vacuum at 1100 degrees centigrade, the longest lived and most common isotopes of americium. 241 and 243 have half-lives of 432.2 and 7,370 years respectively. So uh, 243, which we really haven't talked about, is 7,370 years, half-life. Therefore, all primordial americium that was present on the Earth during its formation should have de decayed by now. So that would mean that the only evidence of americium 241 and 243 that we're talking about in this section would only be um, possible uh, by uh, current nuclear expo explosions or maybe some kind of fission accident happening in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Okay, continuing. Exist existing americium is concentrated in the areas used for the atmospheric nuclear weapons test conducted between 1945 and 1980, as well as at the sites of nuclear incidents, such as the Chernobyl disaster. For example, the analysis of debris at the testing site of the first U.S. hydrogen bomb, IV Mike, 
in November 1st, 1952, and a Wetek Atoll revealed high, I probably pronounced that wrong, revealed high concentrations of various actinides, including americium, due to military secrecy. This result was published only in 1956. Trinitite, the glassy residue left on the desert floor near, near Alamogordo, New Mexico, after the plutonium-based Trinity nuclear bomb test in uh, July 16, 1945, contains traces of americium-241. Elevated levels of americium were also detected at the crash site of the U.S. B-52 bomber, which carried four hydrogen bombs in 1968 and Michael Cremo of Forbidden uh, Archaeology was the first person that I ever heard speak about uh, these glass shards as a direct result of some ancient uh, nuclear wars. And uh, on the website uh, from the Mammoth Trumpet, March 2001, Terrestrial Evidence of a Nuclear Catastrophe in paleo Times, it's uh, uh, by Richard F. Firestone. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and William Topping Consultant, Baldwin, Michigan. And about midway through, uh, chert is the glass-like material highly impervious to penetration by any nuclear fallout that might also contribute to plutonium-239. Um, without getting too deep into it, I just wanted to uh, mark that connection. And uh, this, I, I guess this was something that uh, Michael Cremo himself Having uh, researched uh, archaeological uh, documents and noticed that himself, um, this uh, particular um, evidence in the Paleodean occupation of North America uh, dates around 32,000 years, um, between 12,000 and is inconsistent with much older South American dates of 32,000. So um, I guess between 12,000 and 30,000 years ago. So, um, and uh, there's also evidence in the Upanishads uh, about uh, ancient wars where they used uh, weapons that quite similar to our modern day uh, nuclear weapons. And um, Michael Cremo was interviewed by our host here, James Waggert. In other regions, the other the average radioactivity of surface soil due to residual americium is only about 0 0.01 picocuries per gram. That's 0 0.37 becquerels, I think, or micro becquerels per gram. Atmospheric americium compounds are poorly soluble in common solvents and mostly adhere to soil particles. Soil analysis revealed about 1,900 times higher concentrations of americium inside sandy soil. Well, that would be New Mexico, um, but anyway. Particles then in the water present in the soil pores. So that's good. So it's not lodged in the water lodged in the soil. An even higher ratio was measured in loam soils. So it has a preference to where it likes to lodge itself. Americium is produced mostly artificially in small quantities for research purposes. Mm. A ton of spent nuclear fuel contains about 100 grams of various americium isotopes. I'm going to stop right here because I just got like this flash of of awareness, why would they need to put americium into um, smoke detectors? Um, I, um, okay, that's just another side. I'm not typing this down, but um, I, I'm going to have to remember all these things. This is diabolical. Well, maybe, maybe not. Mostly americium-241 and 243 uh, are uh, available in spent nuclear fuel, which is uh, used or found in um, reactors, nuclear reactors, and as a result of nuclear bombs. Their prolonged radioactivity is undesirable for the disposal and therefore americium, together with other 
long-lived actinides have to be neutralized, the associated procedure may involve several steps where americium is first separated and then converted by neutron bombardment, bombardment, bombardment in special reactors to short-lived nucleides. This procedure is well known as nuclear transmutation, but is still being developed for americium. So in other words, it's in a controlled environment that they're going to bombard it with uh, uh, what neutrons or electrons or whatever they do to change the the isotopes themselves but it's uh, still being developed um, I didn't look at the um, the date that this uh, Wikipedia and don't laugh yes yeah, from Wikipedia uh, definition of uh, americium and its history. Americium has been produced in small quantities in nuclear reactors for decades and kilograms of its 241 and 243 isotopes have been accumulated by nail. Nevertheless, since it was first offered for sale in 1962, its price about 1500 US dollars per gram of 241 remains almost unchanged owing to the very complex separation procedures. The heavier isotope 243 is produced in much smaller amounts. It is therefore more difficult to separate, resulting in a higher cost of, of the order of 100,000 to 160,000 US dollars per gram. So personally, uh, this must be uh, a very important isotope in the uh, production of nuclear bombs uh, for the sale price of that high because it is synthesized in the production of plutonium which is an artificial isotope from what we read above. Americium is not synthesized directly from uranium the most common reactor material but from plutonium isotope uh, 239. The latter needs to be produced first according to the following nuclear process. Boy, it's almost like I'm psychic. The capture of two neutrons by plutonium 239, a so-called nuclear reaction, I'm not sure, followed by the beta decay results in americium 241. The plutonium present or present in the spent nuclear fuel contains about 12% of plutonium-241. Because it spontaneously converts to americium-241, plutonium-241 can be extracted and may be used to generate further americium-241. However, this process is rather slow. Half of the original amount of plutonium-241 decays to americium-241 after about 15 years. They call that slow. And americium-241 amounts reaches the maximum after 70 years. The obtained, I guess it takes that long for them to obtain it, okay, can be used for generating heavier americium isotopes by further neutron capture inside a nuclear reactor. In a light water reactor, LWR, 79% of americium-241 converts to americium-242 and 10% to its nuclear isomer, americium-M-242. And I, I, that M, I'm not sure what that means. Um, uh, maybe it's uh, milligrams, <laughs> millibecquerels, I don't know. I will have to find out the third thing, so I hope I'm remembering this stuff. According to the epa.gov website, plutonium is a radioactive material with atomic number 94. Plutonium is considered a man-made element, element, although scientists have found trace amounts of naturally occurring plutonium produced under highly unusual geological circumstances. The most common radioisotopes of plutonium are plutonium-238, 239, and 240. Plutonium has at least 15 different isotopes, all of which are radioactive. The most common ones are plutonium-238, 239, and 240. 238 has a half-life of 87.7 years, 
239 has a half-life of 24,100 years, and 240 has a half-life of 6,560 years. The isotope 238 plutonium-238 gives off usable heat because of its radioactivity. So that would be the one used in reactors. Residual plutonium from atmospheric nuclear weapons testing is dispersed widely in the environment. As a result, virtually everyone comes into contact with extremely small amounts of plutonium. People who live near nuclear weapons production or testing sites may have increased exposure to plutonium, particularly through particles in the air, but possibly from waste as well. Plants growing in contaminated soil can absorb small amounts of plutonium. The stomach does not absorb plutonium well, and most plutonium swallowed with food or water passes from the body through the feces. When inhaled, plutonium can remain in the lungs depending upon the par partic particle size and how well the particular chemical form dissolves. The chemical forms that dissolve less easily may lodge in the lung or move out with phlegm and either be swallowed or spit out but the lungs may absorb chemical forms that dissolve more easily and pass them into the bloodstream. Once, the bloodstream, once in the bloodstream, plutonium moves throughout the body and into the bones, liver, and other body organs. Plutonium that reaches body organs generally stays in the body for decades and conti continues to expose the surrounding tissue to radiation. Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, EPA limits the amount of radiation in community water systems by establishing maximum contaminant levels. Maximum contaminant levels limit the amount of activity from alpha emitters like plutonium to 15 picocuries per liter. And that was uh, from the www.epa.gov radiation radionucleidesplutonium.com webpage. Okay, and because you wanted to know what the difference is between isomer and an isotope, I checked out funtrivia.com for the answer. And it goes, what's the difference between an isotope and an isomer? I don't know if this will help, but it might bring up more connections like that other uh, glass uh, report did. Isotopes are two atoms with the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. Because they have the same number of protons, they are atoms of the same element but with different masses. And this was uh, asked by Dave Jacobs February 17, 2011. For example, most carbon is carbon-12 with six protons and six neutrons. So that's where the 666 comes from. Uh, so it would be also six electrons. That's where the other six comes from. The radioactive isotope used for carbon dating is carbon C14 with six protons and eight neutrons. Isomers are two molecules with the same atoms joined together in a different shape. For example, butane, butane is carbon-4, hydrogen-10 with the four carbon atoms joined in a straight chain. Now, this doesn't mean much if you're not a uh, chemistry <laughs> major, uh, and I took it for half the course and dropped it, so I'm by no means uh, familiar with this, but I can imagine pictures of circles chained together. So if carbon or atoms, four circles, a chain of four, a carbon atoms joined in a straight chain, I guess it would uh, would be four in a row. Uh, methyl propane is also a carbon four chain, but with carbon atoms joined in a T shape. So maybe it would be three with one to the side or, you know, something like that. So um, different shapes. Um, can refer back to uh, Wikipedia for further explanation. That was actually written on the Fun Trivia website. So uh, that was uh, available at www.funtrivia.com. Ask FT 
questions. Okay, um, americium-242 has a half-life of only 16 hours, which makes it its further up com conversion to americium-243 extremely inefficient. So I guess it, it dissipates too quickly to turn into the bad, really bad stuff <laughs> uh, or the longer, longer lived half-life of 243. Um, the latter isotope is produced instead in a process where plutonium-239 captures four neutrons under high neutron flux. And that was the end of the, the total uh, wikipedia.org americium uh, history and explanation. So uh, I guess we'll go to the banana uh, article. Uh, the, I have an audio pod which is pretty funny. I listened to it again this morning. I hope it works and, and I think I need a little break here as we're coming to the top of the hour when we've got about 15 minutes. So here we go with New Mexico's nuclear waste site releasing massive amounts of B. And I wrote for banana. I don't know if that was a cut off when I copied it or it actually had the words. Here we go. News Channel 4 posted a story called Could a Leak a New Mexico Nuclear Waste Site News Channel 4 posted a story called Could a Leak a New Mexico Nuclear Waste Site Reach the Sooner States where they interviewed Dr. John Nail, a Oklahoma City University chemistry professor who equates radioactive fallout with bananas. And why is Dr. John Nails demonizing bananas? Did he slip on a banana peel and lose a loss? <laughs> was he traumatized by a banana when he was a kid? <laughs> <laughs> did a banana beat him up and steal his lunch money? <laughs> did he get mugged by a banana? Did a banana steal his girlfriend? He probably has to dress up as a banana to get a banana, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Maybe he was sitting there with a banana in his pocket during the interview when he was trying to subconsciously deflect his embarrassment by talking shit about bananas. <laughs> Maybe he's addicted to banana splits, and he rubs it all over himself in the back of his van on the ice cream parking lots, and it's a shame, but he can't control himself. He does have a nervous look to him. Why did Channel 4 ask a banana fear and chemist about nuclear folly when a university is full of real scientists anyway? Is that not yellow journalism? Shouldn't that be considered misleading, even hostile? Dare I say even a hate crime? <laughs> When you see a fire at a repository for nuclear waste and they mention bananas, you have to realize that it's not full of bananas. <laughs> it's full of brutal radioactive uranium-238 with a half-life of 4.5 billion years. Uranium-238 makes up 95% of the nuclear waste there. And it is contaminated with the americium, plutonium, neptunium. You would have to eat 29 million bananas to get the same radiation as a cubic meter of radioactive air from the hot radioactive particles pouring at a New Mexico depository. What they should be looking for is uranium-238 because that is the bulk of the waste and is the real issue. And because they had a fire, no one will get back in there, ever. That place is extraordinarily contaminated. That's a fact. Unless they hired a homeless like they do at Fukushima. So ask yourself, why are they mud raking the good names of bananas? What do bananas ever do to them? It should fall under hate speech laws because, damn it, bananas are people too. This message was brought to you by the Citizens Against University Professors and Scientists Demonizing Bananas in the Fukushima. <laughs> I love that pod. That was awesome. <laughs> I was going to jump it up to the front. I'm glad I saved it to the end because after reading all that crap, I mean, I've been doing this since November, so I'm, I'm kind of immune to the, the horror of the whole thing but um i it, you know it, it's really good to laugh especially when we listen to this crazy nut crap and a really cool thing was i loved that it it uh it connected to a 5000 year old indian documents the upanishads that is just too much um that's why i call my show alchemical connections because no matter what i do and i don't do it on purpose it's not like i go out looking which i wish i was more intuitive in that sense but no matter what i look at or or get interested in it's always connected to something else and you know it's you know not because i'm so brilliant or whatever but everything in this world is connected we are all connected and i love that about knowing about life and uh i i have a friend um 
I'm, I'm going to use this little bit of time to kind of promote my, my good friend, Andrew Norton Weber. He recently um, received a letter from Jay Widener, and I don't know if any of the listeners are uh, familiar with Jay Widener, but he's considered to be the foremost authority or one of the foremost authorities on alchemy. Um, he's done a lot of research. He does a lot of films. Uh, he's written books. And uh, people look up to him uh, when talking about the subject because there's so few in the public outside of the dark arts um, in the occult that uh, many people don't even listen to, which I do because I'm, I'm very interested in, in all of this, who have uh, researched the Philosopher's Stone. And uh, t about 18 months prior to uh, 2012, December uh, 21st, it was a, a book that gave all the directions for all the known alchemical uh, studies of how to create the Philosopher's Stone. And it was uh, called Aquarius something, and, and my good friend Andrew reposted it on Facebook. And I don't open up Facebook when I'm encoding because it screws up everything. But anyway, back to uh, Jay Widener. Um, Jay Widener uh, is just a, an amazing guy. And two years ago, we couldn't get him to talk to us. Um, he he was telling everybody that they better hurry up and make this Philosopher's Stone in which the directions were given in this ebook that just anonymously was posted. And it was just uh, showed up out of nowhere exactly 18 months. And it takes about 18 months to create that Philosopher's Stone that was uh, described and uh, the recipe was given in that ebook. And Andrew and I, uh, we tried to contact William Henry, who uh, was at the time uh, working on this uh, Philosopher's Stone with uh, Jay Widener. So um, they ignored us. There, there was no response, nothing. And um, it was funny, I would say, with this past week, I'm not going to give a date, but this past week, Jay Widener wrote my good friend Andrew Norton Weber a letter and stated to him that um, he was trying to find out what the connection was between urine and rain. And uh, what had happened was, uh, if anybody knows anything about the Philosopher's Stone, uh, as you delve into it, you realize that they do use urine in creating the Philosopher's Stone, but they do all these uh, uh, cooking uh, things it was is a total joke uh, if you listen to Andrew Norton Weber you'll you'll find out that the the whole process is a diversion to keep you like chasing your tail and that's probably the origin of the Ouroboros <laughs> it's not that you're biting your tail you're chasing your tail because they don't come out with giving you the uh, the recipe or giving you the, the secret they it's like the secret um, everybody says when they when they did that that show when they did that uh, video that they left out the most important part well the same with uh, the philosopher stone and this is like an ancient uh, I want to say thousands of years it could be older but at least a couple thousand years uh, and um, so what Andrew figured out and what Jay wanted to know was how was urine and rain connected. And, and Andrew, for since 2011, and he's known it maybe sooner, there's four different types of distilled liquids. There's uh, rain. Rain is distilled water. Uh, there's fruit juice and vegetable juices when you... Uh, when you extract the juices from uh, fruits and vegetables, it's a distilled liquid. There is a distilled water, which you can make from steam distillation. And then the fourth one would be urine. And if anybody looks up uh, nephron, which are tiny uh, parts of your kidneys, um, there's hundreds of thousands of them in your kidneys. And you look at the shape, you, you, no one will mistake that it looks exactly like a distiller. And it's ironic that, you know, when you when you look at these um, hillbilly mo movies or um, 
uh, movies uh, back at the turn of the century when they had um, uh, prohibited um, alcohol in the distillers. It, it, it looks like the same exact thing. Well, anyway, back to the letter. Um, Jay Widener uh, said he had watched some of Andrew Norton Weber's uh, videos, which there are many, many uh, available on YouTube. Uh, so many people have interviewed him now, and one of them was uh, Jay Widener's friend, uh, Robert Phoenix, who is an astrologer. And uh, uh, there's an interview which you can check out. It's uh, Robert Phoenix and Andrew Norton Weber, which I think is the most uh, up-to-date report. And each time I listen to Andrew, uh, when he talks, he gets more concise because uh, he's always wanting to give you the, all the information. But uh, he's narrowing it down to what's the most vital, and he can do that now within an hour and a half. Uh, give you a, a wealth of knowledge on uh, distilled waters is what, you, what he calls it. That will just uh, amaze you. And what Jay Widener said was that he believes, and it's his opinion, not anybody else's. Well, it's my opinion too. And Andrew, of course, knew that immediately when he read that book two years ago. That Andrew Norton Weber has cracked the alchemy code. Um, he has figured out the philosopher's stone and uh, the waters of life. And uh, well, I just want to give the gigantic shout out to my amazing friend, Andrew Norton Weber. And if you listen to that uh, podcast with uh, Robert Phoenix and Andrew Norton Weber, Andrew goes on to explain how we can use rainwater because I've always been opposed to uh, a, 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 even admitting that it would be something that you could drink. But you get a particulate meter um, that uh, measures uh, particulate in the water and uh, if you let the water sit, uh, apparently it settles or dissipates. And you read the water after a certain amount of time, and you'll see that it could go from 700 parts per million to four or five parts per million, and then it's safe to drink. So what Andrew has actually done has not only cracked the code of alchemy, but has um, provided the safest and the most uh, effective way to heal our bodies from any damage. So if we could just stop infecting ourselves in the world, that we could heal in no time. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to get this all in before the top of the hour, but um, it, it really deserves a lot more time. But I just wanted to add that in because I think that is the most amazing and important thing. And anybody else who doesn't think so, uh, will eventually, and you don't have to just drink your piss. Um, you can drink distilled water, uh, rain water, fruit, vegetable juices, and uh, and you can mix your piss in with any of those three too. Uh, but the urine is the most medicinal because it includes uh, hormones uh, and other nutrients that are created by your body in excess through your blood because it's a direct uh, line from your blood to your bladder. Uh, that you could re-ingest and re-support health. So, um, and also it works externally and uh, internally. So uh, here we are at the top of the hour and I don't want to make this a urine therapy show, but um, uh, I posted about the smoke detectors and I wanted to know why they were using americium, I'm mistake. Uh, and uh, what I came up with was pretty cool. Um, apparently, they put a small amount that, you know, can affect humans, but uh, americium is deadly to humans, toxic. But um, They put it in smoke detectors, and the smoke detectors that they don't use it in aren't as effective. So, I just think it's interesting in how they would even come up with that, and um, how they slowly, slowly, slowly are putting more and more radiation with smart meters and stuff like that into our everyday life. Well, of course, the microwaves, then the smoke detectors, and now the uh, smart meters. So, uh, and of course, the bricks they use to build the houses are full of radium. Um, 
and just keep making a little metal note it's one of those connections I kind of put on a shelf and kind of leave it there for a later date where it will be revealed it's interesting how all these things come up and I know there was a third thing and I don't remember what it was so I can't really remember to to what we were going to talk about but um I think that's done for the Fukushima weekly update I um there's not really any new information I mean we can just get a uh, professional opinions which uh, we've had a lot of that in the last three years uh, we are coming up on the uh, three-year anniversary uh, I believe it will be March 11th and that's almost uh, two weeks away well a little, little less than two weeks away and uh, that'll be on a Tuesday so probably do something on a Sunday some special for that and uh, we'll look for more information uh, people are mostly posting on how to uh, eat miso soup and keep yourself healthy and stuff like that so I, I think that's really good and I think what I reported from my friend uh, Andrew Norton Weber was probably the most effective information um, our bodies can heal themselves so we're uh, pretty amazing beings and uh, besides that we're beings of light and we don't really even know how powerful we it's just amazing when you wake up to this information and you you realize everything's connected we're absolutely amazing individuals and uh, and we can do things to change this whole construct and I, and I kind of want to believe that the uh, the leak in uh, New Mexico is not just a diversion but uh, because of the the high level of despondency the nuclear radiation can cause in the psyche that it it's actually meant you know to to really disrupt our ability to concentrate on what we want most in this life and if we're focusing on the dangers of this world we're in no way shape or form able to focus on our, our own health and well-being so as long as we're, we're kicked off that balance we don't have that st stability of, of owning the, the responsibility of knowing that it that we are sovereign in our own beings and and our health our body is more than capable of healing itself we are we are constantly being hit with this craziness so um, I don't want to just stop reporting on it uh, but I'm following people who are not and one of the people who I admire greatly um, allegedly known as Dave who is actually the one of the um, uh, founders of Awake Radio and this website um, he he's not really reporting and he's not doing anything on the radio he's doing conferences but he's mostly working on consciousness and um, although he is doing that um, I see that periodically he posts things that are kind of sensationalized like uh, the recent uh, I think it's Florida woman uh, was cited for getting off the grid and they told her that she wasn't allowed to <laughs> they actually took her to court and I think she's winning her lawsuits but uh, she's uh, still has uh, more hurdles to cross because what they do to people who um, ha are effectively uh, changing the paradigm is because they have so much money they can keep you in the court system. I, they've done it to uh, Gearson. Uh, they've done it to uh, so many other people. At the top of my head, um, Royal Rife. Uh, anybody who had any kind of information that uh, benefited themselves or society have been marginalized, demeaned, and uh, demonized. It's just. Uh, uh, it's amazing but now we know what the system is so we have a better opportunity to uh, fight against that 
So although I'm, I'm not prepared with any videos or articles about that specific incident, I want to go back to um, to observing people who are not so much focused on um, the sensationalization of events that are not healthy or in our best interest. So um, I, I think it's a difficult path. It, it's a really fine line not to be uh, attracted to and, uh, and put your attention and emotions mostly onto these things. And like I said earlier, that I'm, I'm kind of immune uh, to the horrors of uh, the radioactive uh, revelations that I'm expounding here on these weekly updates, uh, as I am calling them now. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. And laughter, uh, we discharge that energy when we laugh. So comedy is a really a great way to... Uh, uh, provide this information and I, I really feel bad because I think that John Daly and uh, uh, Colbert do not go far enough. I think Colbert goes a little bit further but I don't think they go far enough in reporting uh, all the, uh, the deviousness of what's going on in our government around the world, governments around the world. And, um, and I think recently um, there were... Uh, reports about uh, Russia because of the Ukraine. Um, there was something that happened in it and they're calling it a declaration of war. So I think that's another, uh, excuse me, another diversion because I believe all these countries, the, the leadership in all these countries are absolutely sitting down, whether on Skype or whatever the equivalent is in the, in the deep dark black ops military cabal uh, discussing what their next moves are to uh, keep us off track off center so as we watch these things expand in a world I don't want to minimize uh, people are being killed uh, people are being harmed some people aren't uh, like Sandy Hook um, really no evidence and then more and more people are coming out and it's <laughs> and I've lost friends on Facebook over this so so many, many months afterwards because uh, they're angry because people were killed and at the uh, Boston bombing and stuff like that. So um, I'm just reporting the information. I'm trying not to take a stance. I'm trying not to say I, I'm for this or against that. But I am for life and I'm for whatever um, props that up. So that's my story and I'm going to stick to it. And uh, I didn't expect to go here right now. Um, I really didn't have anywhere to go. And I didn't want to just play songs. Because I think that's the easy way out. <laughs> and I have to cut them out of the podcast when I post it. Or it doesn't go all around the world. And, uh, and I really like to talk about important things. Uh, mostly individuals. Uh, individual power to change our world and I know a lot of people think one person can't do it but we just look at over and over again Gandhi was killed Martin Luther King was killed um, you know so many people who stood up and made a difference in the world John Lennon and that's just you know scratching the, the tip of the iceberg that's not even the wealth of all the people who have gone before them to uh, really make a difference in this uh, in this world, um, there's even evidence that Helen Petrova Blavatsky was uh, uh, poisoned by Annie Besant. And uh, whatever you think about Annie Besant, uh, she was the one of the originators of the UN. And uh, all those uh, three-letter groups that um, pilfered forward. Um, she was really instrumental in this new world order and uh, and Helen Blavatsky HPV she warned against it uh, and she wanted to give us this information she was instrumental in opening the doors to as we talked about alchemy to uh, the hidden hidden science the metaphysics of, of reality um, everything you think you know 
is not as it appears. And it, without saying that it's not true, I uh, just want to say that if you do some research just a little bit, um, you'll probably find uh, more information. I had a friend, I, I sent her the link about Andrew Norton Weber to, uh, to, to look at urine therapy and all this stuff. And she did look up distilled waters. And the first website that comes up is the Mercola, Dr. Mercola website where it says distilled water kills. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when somebody reads that, their first uh, initial response is like, oh my God, is she drinking that? Oh my God. Well, by the way, I've been drinking distilled water uh, primarily with only lapses in because I'm away from home uh, and uh, can't get a bottle of distilled water for three plus years, since 2010, late 2010. So, um, uh, you know, I think it's improved my health in so many ways, uh, while meditating in the beginning, uh, drinking distilled water, just steam distilled water. Um, I had extreme visions. Um, I could see with my eyes closed in meditation. Um, I haven't been doing that since the, the first year. And it, and I know that this works. I know that that it opens up the pineal because the pineal calcifies as we age and as a result of fluoridation, um, it calcifies all uh, all the soft tissue and uh, does terrible things to your teeth. That's why everybody's teeth are yellowing. They call fluorosis, and they say that um, it only happens to young children because their teeth are developing. But why has everybody got to whiten their teeth? If we've been brushing our teeth with uh, fluoride since forever, the 40s or 50s, um, why don't we have white bright teeth? Why does everybody have to use bleach and all kinds of concoctions so they can have pearly white teeth and, uh, and so many dental problems? It's unbelievable. Uh, no wonder why dentists were uh, suiciding themselves, which uh, probably... Uh, was probably one of the first indications that people were coming out and trying to report on mercury fillings and uh, the toxification of, uh, you know, we can just go on down the list of what they do. But I don't want to be a fear monger here because we're all about levity. We want to laugh and have fun and enjoy life. We just don't want to seek uh, pleasure, but we want to actually live a joyful life prosperous and abundant life that's what we want to do and my role as a host on this uh, and other radio shows is to provide information so people can make informed choices and do what's in their best interest so as I move forward on my path uh, I can see that um, all this information is uplifting me and uh, I don't want to feed into the Agenda 21 because I believe that they give us the picture and we make it real by how we respond to it. So as we report these stories, as we report vaccinations, as we report, you know, uh, financial uh, uh, theft, and we know that there's more gold in this world than, than we could all be trillionaires. And they've hoarded it and stolen it and, and locked it away for whatever reason. Um, I think there's a cartoon with uh, uh, one of the Disney cartoons where the Uncle Uncle Scrooge uh, McQuack or whatever his name is, he's, he has this one room where he dives into a pool of gold coins. Um, I, I, I think that's probably the epitome of the, the mindset but the more I delve into this Fukushima, uh, I, I have to wonder if people, if there aren't entities that are actually feeding off of this uh, uh, nuclear energy. Um, there's a movie called, uh, what the heck is it called? Uh, Phantasm. I don't know. It's probably over 20 years old. And there's this one scene it's in a cemetery, in a, a crematorium, and the, the crematorium is actually a portal, 
and they have these vats of this what you know would be comically called a nuclear radiation glow and it, and they just glow the life from within and they're and they're putting these vats into the portal but it could also be a metaphor for uh, taking life and the light beings that we are within ourselves and stealing that light and, and sending it to another portal and and there is a uh, Ashayana Dean who I follow and and not really talked about and and one of the only sources that does talk about it that because our, our planets are all tilted um that's why they never show pictures of other planetary systems um because they would be straight and um there's uh ley lines we talk about ley lines that stretch out across the galaxies across the planets that when we revolve we touch each other and spark off the energy and we're off kilter and we're being dragged into an alternate alternate dimension and I I, I very rarely talk about that but you know I keep that in the back of my mind when I think about these things and uh, there there really isn't a whole lot of evidence and other um, channeled information and she does a different kind of channeling her she says is electronic is like an electronic download that doesn't harm the body where um, other channelers like Ed Casey actually it deteriorated his body because of uh, what they did when they came in and a lot of it if you really read into his history uh, was devious information it wasn't actually information that was uh, truthful and the only things that were really truthful that he reported on were the health situations which in an alternative reality and my perspective on uh, quantum consciousness is that what you believe you can make manifest so uh, you know there's a belief system uh, the uh, the observer affects the experiment I'll I'll just want to acknowledge uh, again uh, these wonderful radio stations that are doing this wonderful work and reporting this information but I also want to couple that with the the need to um, to take this information with a grain of salt and and I know that's hard to do when people are starving when people are being killed when information is being suppressed and all your rights are dwindling um, I, I I don't want to marginalize any of that information. I, I want to be supportive of getting that information out so people are informed and they can make informed, uh, rational, healthy decisions for the, not just themselves, for, but for the whole world. Because I believe everything I do affects everyone and everything. So I have to be very conscious of that, living a mindful life. So I think the motto of my life is to live mindfully. And I do that best by being aware that everything that I do and say and think has uh, direct results, not just for myself and my immediate surroundings, but clear off into affinity. So with that great philosophizing, which I don't consider myself to be at all, I just consider myself to be a seeker, um, a wanderer who is treading somewhat more lightly uh, as I age gracefully as a result of uh, the wonderful benefits of distilled waters uh, and just want to continue to uh, to uh, support my good friends in the distilled waters camp as I support my dear friends and family in uh, in the real and the backwards or whatever you want to call it, land that we live here. So uh, I think this is enough time we can listen to Despicable Me. I'm happy. I love the song. I think it's wonderful. And I want to thank everybody for listening. And thank Penn and Peace and Chat and my wonderful friend uh, Pam, who uh, was chatting with me earlier. And... Uh, I guess that's it for now, and uh, we'll see what we can do uh, after this top of the hour. Thank you for listening to awakeradio.co.uk and shizizradio.com. This was Alchemical Connections, Fukushima Weekly Update, and uh, a little bit of everything alchemical, because after all, we're all connected. Mm-hmm.